What happens in the United States is a kind of ethnic melting pot, and it's not necessarily that they're melting with other people, but Hungarian, Romanian, uh, Lithuanian, Congress Poland, Belarus, Hung uh, the German Jews, they're all kind of occupying some um, same spaces. And what develops is an American Jewish cuisine. I think one could say that a Hungarian Jew had never eaten a bagel. Welcome to 18 Jewish Foods, culture and history in kosher bite-sized portions. This podcast tells the stories of iconic Jewish dishes, shedding light on the people who eat them. Here's your host, Joel Haber. Perhaps the question I get asked most frequently about Jewish food is, are bagels really Jewish? I'm going to answer that in this episode, but also through the bagel, I'd like to get a deeper look on the character of American Jewry. Now, at the risk of stating the obvious, since the bagels have become so ubiquitous and so recognized, what exactly is a bagel? It's often described as a roll with a hole, but it is way more than that, as any of its adherents and lovers will tell you. Bagels are made of wheat flour, as opposed to rye flour or uh, some other kind of flour. And most significantly, they must be boiled before they are baked. They are ring-shaped, and they typically have a crusty exterior, but that crust is chewy rather than a crispy crust. They usually have a fairly dense interior dough, making it also chewy with a small, almost non-existent crumb. But let's look a little bit more deeply at each of those elements. People might have reacted when I said that it's a wheat flour. There are, for example, rye bagels or oat bagels or even gluten-free bagels. And while I will say that, yes, those do exist, they are all newer versions, the original bagel was most certainly a purely wheat flour dough. What about if it's not boiled before it's baked? Well, frankly, that is not a bagel. That is just a roll with a hole. The pre-boiling element is one of the things that truly turns this roll into something unique from other types of rolls. It must be boiled before it's baked. In the boiling process, malt within the water is also key. This is what helps the bagel to form the type of crust one wants on it. What about something like a flagel, which is a totally flattened bagel? I would say that this is clearly not a bagel. It may be a derivative of the bagel, but it is a new product. Other elements that make the bagel dough into real bagel dough is that the flour typically has a higher gluten content and a lower water to flour ratio in the dough. These things help to create the denseness and the chewiness of the bread itself. And as we'll soon see, at least that first change is something that specifically happens in America. But now that we've established what a bagel actually is, what are its origins? There is massive dispute among scholars as to the potential precursor of the bagel. Maria Belinska in 2008 published an excellent study on the bagel that is appropriately named The Bagel the surprising history of a modest bread. It is particularly well-researched. I find it to be very convincing, her arguments, and it is also really easy to read, so I highly recommend that anybody who's interested picks it up. And in it, she examines and rejects multiple of the potential options and settles on the most likely origin, which is in Poland, particularly in Krakow, as a descendant of the German pretzel. Both are made out of wheat flour rather than the rye that was so popular in the region. Both are boiled before they are baked. And significantly, the majority of the Jews of Poland actually came from Germany previously. Now, many have heard a very famous story that the bagel was invented to honor 
Jan Sobieski, who went on to be king of Poland after his victory at the Battle of Vienna. And it's a beautiful story, but there's a big problem. The first written mention of the bagel that we are familiar with is from the year 1610 in Krakow in a, a legal code. Sobieski, however, was only born in 1629. 19 years later, and the Battle of Vienna was in 1683. So there's no way that it could have been invented to honor him in 1683 if it's already mentioned in 1610. This is a perfect example of what we call culinary mythology, stories that crop up all over the world to explain the origins of foods that are not necessarily, or in this case, definitely not accurate and true. What it may reflect is the Jewish love and respect for Jan Sobieski, who was particularly good for the Jews and seen as such by the Jewish people of Poland. Now, if the bagel actually descends from the pretzel, can we say that it is a Jewish food? Well, looking at its closest relative, a cousin, if you will, also descended from the pretzel, we find the Polish obwarzanek. This is very similar to a bagel, except that the dough is twisted, strands of dough twisted, and then formed into a ring shape. In the early 20th century, there was a Polish dictionary, and in it, it defines the bagel as, quote, Jewish obwarzanek. And even earlier than that, by the late 18th century, there are sources in Poland that very clearly associate bagels with Jews in Poland. So did we invent the bagel? Well, that really depends on your definition of at what point does something in the continuum of foods turn into a new food. But regardless of whether we actually invented it, which would make it fall into the very first category of genuine Jewish foods that I mentioned in episode one, it certainly falls into category three, which is foods that are strongly associated with Jews. The very fact that people ask me, are bagels really Jewish, indicates that in the consciousness of society, they are considered to be Jewish. And definitely we see from these two Polish sources that it was seen in Poland as a Jewish food. And until even late in the 20th century in America, they were largely only eaten by Jews. Reflecting how they've risen to a cultural dominance in the world, I was looking up Overzanek on YouTube, and I came across a Polish cook who was describing how to make Obwarzanek, and she refers to Obwarzanek as Polish bagels. So we went from being having bagels that are Jewish obwarzanek to obwarzanek being Polish bagels. So now that we've gotten the origin and the definition of bagels out of the way, let's look at the connection between the bagel and American Jewry, because it is there that bagels become a true cultural phenomenon. The most obvious change to affect the bagel in America was their size. In Europe, they were rather small in terms of the quantity of dough, and they had a very large hole in the middle. There was a reference in a rabbinic source to eating three of them for breakfast. And even those were not a massive quantity because there was even a question about whether there was enough bread there to make the hamotzi blessing, the blessing over bread that requires a minimum quantity. As I said, the higher gluten content is an American change as well. American wheat has more gluten than traditional European bread wheat, and that physically allows the bagel to turn into a bigger bread. But beyond that, the growth in the size of the bagel reflects increased wealth in American Jewry. As I already discussed in the pastrami episode, American Jewish foods differed significantly from the versions known in Europe. And part of that was due to the increased affluence of American Jewry. The overstuffed deli sandwich is the equivalent of a bagel that is double or triple the size of ones that were eaten in Europe and with only a tiny hole in the middle rather than a massive gaping one. But we can also look at the cultural connection to bagels. The bagel remained internally Jewish for a very long time. 
only in the 40s or 50s did it start to penetrate into the broader American consciousness. And it's really not until the 80s that it is so widely recognized across America. One of the things that maintained the Jewish character of the bagel was that in New York, there was a particularly strong union of bagel bakers. One of the things that allowed this union to become strong was that they had to be rolled by hand. Many people attempted to mechanize the process of rolling bagels, but none of them successfully did so. And therefore it was skilled labor. So if it was still primarily eaten by Jews and really only known by Jews, how is it that the bagel goes on to conquer America? The best way to see this transformation is via one company, Lenders. Harry Lender basically did a lot of innovation to take the bagel from a bread that was hand rolled, made by Jews in Jewish neighborhoods and bring it to the masses, bring it to non-Jews, ship it across America, raise its recognition factor. The first innovation was locating a rolling machine that actually works. He did not invent the rolling machine, but he located one, an invention that worked and began using it quickly, allowing him to speed up the production process. High quality freezers were another important innovation that he utilized. First, so that he could prepare bagels in advance, freezers later allowed him to start shipping his bagels countrywide. And with the growth of frozen foods as a category in general, it turned his frozen bagels from a mere convenience into a marketing benefit. And then he had the idea to sell them pre-sliced. This allowed them packaged in plastic bags to reach grocery stores rather than you needing to go to a bagel bakery to buy your bagels. Were Lenders bagels that were frozen and sent across the country the same as one that was made, let's say, in New York City on the Lower East Side? Certainly not. But it didn't really matter in the long run. Lenders bagels kind of became the gateway drug and got people aware of and interested and loving bagels. And so once suburbanization grows and you start to get real bagel stores all across the 50 states, those who were first introduced to them via lenders knew what they were and could support them. All of this reflects the overall integration of American Jews into American society. Never before have Jews been as ensconced in their national culture as they have been in America. To explore the bagel in America a bit more deeply, I turn to Hasia Diner. Hasia is Professor Emerita at NYU. Her focus has been on American Jewish history. She has written numerous books, but the one that really made me feel she was the appropriate person for this interview was 2000's Hungering for America, in which she points out the drive for affordable food as the primary force for Italian, Irish, and Jewish immigrants. The Jewish food in America is different than it was in Europe. And starting with bagels, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how they changed or differed in America from in Europe. Okay, I miss, um, a great question. All immigrant, you know, all foods we asso associate as ethnic foods, be it Italian, Chinese, Mexican, whatever, all changed. That is, there's nothing unique about the Jewish story. And this is because people came to a place where food was cheap. And uh, most of these immigrants are um, living in cities where there's just a lot of stuff available. And uh, ingredients uh, that they might have known back home just don't exist. And um, two things in particular, and this will then lead us to the bagel, is for one thing, they are living in uh, tr real proximity to other people who have totally different foods. 
with Italians, with Greeks, with all sorts of new people. And all those new people um, kind of can pass the sniff test. Like, wow, that smells really good. There's one wonderful memoir of a young woman who works um, in a garment shop with a lot of Italian girls. And she looks at my, what beautiful stuff. And the smells. I mean, I I'll be honest that like I experienced the same thing I would sit next to a guy at work who is eating Texas barbecue pork ribs and they smelled incredible. And I'm like, if I could, I would have eaten right. a bite kosher. But like, so that, yeah. that still exists today. Absolutely. I mean, I have neighbors who cook bacon and I think, God, that is so good. I can see why people love it. Totally. So, I mean, I think that's a really important part of the, the kind of American story. The other, uh, I think, really important part of the story is that they come from a variety of places, each with their own own sort of food ways. And you know, you might want to say, hey, wait a minute, what about Italians? They all come from Italy. But that's, they may come from, quote, a country called Italy, but it has vast regional differences. So to get back to the Jewish story and the bagel, so the bagel was a role, I mean, it was a thing um, among Polish Jews and particularly um, in the large cities. But um, what happens in the United States is a kind of ethnic melting pot. And it's not necessarily that they're melting with other people, but Hungarian, Romanian, uh, Lithuanian, Congress Poland, Belarus, Hung uh, the German Jews, they're all kind of occupying some um, same spaces. And what develops is an American Jewish cuisine. I think one could say that a Hungarian Jew had never eaten a bagel, but they come to New York or Chicago and there are bagels in, in the same bakeries where they're getting rye bread, which was German. So you mentioned rye bread, and it highlights another sort of interesting thing that many foods that in Europe were eaten by everybody in America became associated specifically with Jews. For example, you go into a grocery store today and you can buy Jewish rye bread. Right. And I'd love to hear your take on how that is that these foods that were not specifically Jewish in Europe became mm. known as specifically Jewish in America. In a way, it connects to how the bagel uh, then explodes into the American con uh, marketplace, which is packaging and marketing. And uh, Germans ate rye bread. And in fact, all through the Baltics, uh, rye bread was really uh, the kind of staff of life. So the first real wave of East European Jews who come to the United States are Lithuanian. And so there you're on the Baltic. And Lithuania was a kind of crossroads between, well, it's in the Russian Empire, but it's also borders on both Poland, and it has a strong German influence. You, you mentioned that it was kind of marketing. Do you think mm -hmm. that was something active, or was it people associated with Jews, and so then we started calling it Jewish rye bread? Mm. Well, I think if we go back to the bagel, someone like Harry Lender is truly a marketer of this thing that, you know, 50 years earlier, not only a Jew from Ukraine would have never heard of, let alone an American of Norwegian background. I mean, I, I say this not in any pejorative manner. It's a way of uh, making a business, making a profit, and calling it Jewish becomes a kind of cachet. Uh, it's not associated with the group you look down on. So again, I think bagels go through that same um, very deliberate marketing. But even Harry Lender, his customers were Italian just like they were Jews. You know, it's part of this um, ethnic exchange um, that I would say made America great. <laughs> So in Hungering for America, you point out two things. First of all, you point out how Jews in America ate well. They were eating like wealthy people every day. And also that in America, traditional foods changed. With the bagel, we see, as I understand, a growth in size of the bagel. Yeah, you're right. As well as it used to just be something you'd munch on, and then it became something as a base for sandwiches and even fancy sandwiches. So in terms of size and the process by which immigrants, who by definition came from a certain class, okay, no, you know, people who are well off don't immigrate. Uh, but I think um, I refer to them in Hungry for America as the almost hungry, because also the very poorest, they just can't afford to, to immigrate. And so these are people who did live on pretty meager diets. And so for all sorts of complex reasons, food in America was cheap. 
But for the most part, they ate and they ate meat every day. And their association, who who back home got to eat meat every day? But it was the rich people. It's one reason, again, that the food gets bigger because they can afford it. And and yes, the context in which people eat it. Not only was it um, not eaten the way we eat it now, uh, the idea that it was something special. I mean, it was just a role, and there were other roles. There were platzlach, there was zemlach. That it moved from being, one might say, it seems almost like a silly thing to say, one of many roles <laughs> to the role is associated with its marketing. And obviously nothing inherently better about a bagel than a pretzel, although I would take a pretzel anytime and I haven't had one in many, many, many decades. I was just gonna say they're hard to find these days. Oh yeah, my mother used to make hand make them and they were so good. But you know what? You couldn't cut them and put make them into a sandwich. No. Right, they were too thin, and so what's great about the bagel? But you also didn't need to because they tasted so good on their own. That's right. All uh, those onions and poppy seeds makes uh, it perfect. Phenomenal. So what's great about the bagel? And again, this is by the way something that's commented on about Americans is that Americans eat on the go, and so rather than sit down and have a civilized meal, you know, they take their food in their hand and they eat it while they're walking and while they're getting onto the subway. And um, so the bagel became perfect for that because you can cut it in half. You put on your your schmear or whatever. And it's like totally portable and uh, it um, it served an American beat. Yeah, and it wasn't just the bagel itself, but it was whatever went inside of it to make it kind of a full meal. But you're still eating it, you know, scarfing it down while you're rushing off to something else. Now, speaking of those sandwiches, the most iconic has to be the bagel, cream cheese, and lox. This trio of foods are even more iconic than the bagel itself. Hebrew University professor Shaul Stamfer, in a really interesting article called Bagels and Falafel, points out that this trio reflects a nostalgia for the past. The boom in popularity of bagels and particularly of this sandwich is really in the 40s and 50s, a time of great change in American Jewry, which would, of course, raise the desire for nostalgia. He even points out how the newest of the three ingredients, the cream cheese, is often referred to not as cream cheese, but using a Yiddish name for it, a schmear. But this trio sandwich also is significant, as many scholars have pointed out, because visually the sandwich appears to be not kosher. Of all fish, lox is the one that most heavily resembles meat, and having it on a sandwich with cream cheese would, if it were meat, be not kosher. In a way, this is fake treif. This visual not kosher while remaining kosher, to a degree, reflects American Jewish assimilation. Even when Jews began to assimilate in America and become more secular and more integrated into not Jewish society, often they maintained connections somehow to their Jewish roots. Finally, once bagels reach true icon status, they begin to morph and turn into all sorts of things that are descendants of the bagel, but are not bagels themselves. You can go into a supermarket and buy bagel chips that are delicious, but are not bagels. They're just made from bagels. Bagel dogs were very popular for a while, where uh, rather than a corn dog, a hot dog is encased in bagel dough. I used to love them. Recently, there was a, a bit of a heated controversy when a Montreal bagel bakery, a famous one, decided temporarily to sell a bagel without a hole. If it's no longer ring-shaped, can we still call it a bagel? I'll say no. But with all of these things, we see how the bagel is truly iconic as a Jewish food and specifically as an American Jewish food. I'm still finalizing some of the details of the next episode's interview, and so I'm going to hold off on telling you what it is. It'll be a surprise. We're close to the end anyway, so I hope you'll come back next episode and until then, I wish you all an easy fast for those who will be fasting on Yom Kippur. And I hope that you enjoy the Sukkot holiday.
Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed. Got any questions or comments? Please feel free to email me at jewishfoodbook at gmail.com. Please listen, like, and follow wherever you get your podcasts, and I would truly appreciate it if you'd share this with other Jewish food lovers. The theme music you hear is Adir Who Revisited by Rebbe Soul. Check him out wherever you stream music. And as always, until next time, I wish you the Teavon. Thank you.